Masuk bang. Masuk. Coba pas masuk, masuk open ya. Open. Hi, buddy, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Wolfgang, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. And you prefer not to show your face or is it a connection problem? No, I'm just um, new at using Zoom and I'm trying to get the video to work, but I see. Let me see. <coughs> Okay, in one minute, we will start on time. Uh, I hope you don't mind that I order the presentation with uh, the deepest thinker first. Actually, all of us are deep thinkers, but this is in a matter of degree, yeah? uh, in a sense that we have prepared a deep, very deep presentation, each of you. And uh, I'm sorry, I have to admit, Okay, uh, the first presenter will be uh, Wolfgang, followed by Buddy and closed by my buddy here. <laughs> so he will, he's actually beside me. He has sent me his presentation, but he's a perfectionist. He's preparing, he's perfecting his presentation still, yeah? Okay, so all right, it's 7.30. So I'm going to share my screen and, in, and start our webinar. I hope all of us are fine. This presentation is conducted in two languages, if necessary. First, uh, English, of course, and second, Indonesian. If any of our Indonesian audience uh, request it, of course, it's only because the, it is hosted from Indonesia. And well, I can see that one Indonesian friends or one Indonesian acquaintance have joined. Yeah? And if you can see my screen here, uh, So our title today is The Political Economy of uh, Corruption. This is a very important topic and uh, it is organized, uh, actually we, we are affiliated but with many institutions, but we prefer to have uh, our own names attached to uh, our, our events, yeah? So it's by... Uh, uh, please mute, yeah, by myself, Surya Dalimunte, and my wife, Aprilia, who's sitting beside me. And one moment. Uh, and we, I, 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 like to, I like to say that we form a, a sort of network called uh, Indonesian Independent Intellectual or in Indonesian, Intellectual Independent Indonesia. Like Wolfgang and like Buddy, I think, we are not that much affiliated with uh, formal academic institutions. So we have independent minds and independent spirit, which is reflected in our research. And so uh, this is the order, as I said to you, uh, uh, in, uh, roughly, Wolfgang uh, will introduce himself, his project, and presents on corruption and state building mainly, and expands and elaborates on these issues. Buddy uh, will present on how neoliberalism enables corruption. Uh, in fact, it enables corruption, uh, which makes people criticize corruption, which makes uh, uh, the elites uh, offer more neoliberalism as a solution. So it's a very uh, devious uh, ideology, which Buddy later will elaborate and also some other aspects of his presentation. And last but not least, we have Sobul Ansar Siregar. This is in Indonesia, yeah, the myth of corruption eradication. I think uh, talking a lot about, about Indonesia, but I think it can be uh, also applicable to other countries, especially post-colonial countries or developing countries. I don't like to use that term, but it is the common term. Uh, and 
Let me introduce our speakers briefly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Sohibul and Wolfgang, I think, uh, found or co-founds their own uh, organizations. Sohibul has these organizations called uh, Enbasis, which stands for Pengembangan Basis Initiative and uh, Dan Swadaya, which means uh, uh, the development of uh, social basis the development of social and independent basis. Uh, it, it was founded a long time ago, perhaps about 20 years ago, since the Indonesian reformation, and it deals with intellectual, political, social uh, issues. So uh, Sohibul uh, is the head of Wisdom and Public Policy Unit uh, for North Sumatra Muhammadiyah. Muhammadiyah is a very large uh, mass organization, Muslim mass organization, uh, the second largest. Uh, in Indonesia and it's very influential in determining the course of Indonesian politics, life, and everything. So, sorry, sorry, Surya. While, while I completely understand, I just need to have a bong before I can completely um, understand what's going on. Just, just let me just rip this first. <laughs> Do you have any question, Mike? Can I, can I continue with introduction? Yeah, please continue. Sorry, I just needed a bong. Please continue. <laughs> very interesting, yeah, Mike Hunt. Okay, Wolfgang is the co-founder, I think, of the, if I'm not mistaken, Association for New European Political Economics. I find him uh, very enlightening. In fact, I, I didn't know him before. I was just researching about, frankly, criticism to MMT, yeah? modern monetary theory, and I find uh, his, um, how do you say, his comments very instructive, despite uh, whether or not I agree with it is another matter. But uh, I checked out his academia page, and I can see a lot of uh, uh, very deep materials. And he reads widely, he reads deeply, and he has his own takes on a lot of things. And I think we will enjoy his introduction or his first presentation later. Last but not least, Buddy is a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, or even is a multi-talented uh, guy, person. He is... Uh, Musician. <laughs> He's a man of many talents, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a musician, but he's very Mike. interested in uh, the development of his country and humanity, I think. And uh, yesterday we have a he chat. He goes to this country. Yeah, yesterday Shit, we had a man, chat. Fuck off. Yesterday we had a chat about uh, 10 minutes, uh, and he said that he came to economics independently. And uh, he is a very uh, uh, quote unquote yeah pragmatic person. Uh, he sees when he sees an intellectual theory that fits his uh, reality according to him. So he he he, he adopts those and uh, uh, expands on how uh, the the theory uh, can help uh, South Africa, especially uh, to develop uh, fairly, prosperly, justly. And that's it from me. So those are my contact. If you want to get in touch, uh, the number is WhatsApp number. The email is Gmail. And I hope uh, all of us can get in touch after this webinar. And it will be uh, showcased on YouTube, uh, bit.ly uh, slash uh, Surya channel, yeah? S-U-R-Y-A channel. And you can see, uh, uh, we will upload the video as soon as possible when connection uh, permitting. Uh, let me just show you also briefly. Yeah, so this is uh, <coughs> Wolfgang's Twitter, moneymind underscore ANEP. Uh, so tweets on legal institutionalism. That's his uh, expertise, yeah? Uh, I just, I just, I just, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanna, how are we making money here? So wh where's the money coming in? Uh, he will present it later. Uh, no, I want to see the money now. Uh, are, we, are we talking about Bitcoin or are we talking about like normal shares? Is it crypto? Like, I, I, we can go crypto. I mean, if, if, if we want to talk crypto, I'm your man. We make big For money real. on crypto. I don't Maybe know what I'll, you guys are talking about. Let I don't us, know what this forum is. Let us, uh, let us uh, do the question and answer and comment session uh, at the end, yeah? Let us hear the presenters first. And we can command, criticize. All right, but I just, I just feel like I don't. Like I've already wasted enough of my time, and I'm not making money. Like this is time is money, and money is time. <laughs> and right I now, I'm not really making point. money. Yeah, I don't think you're going to make any money with the information that you're going to get now. So if your interest is 
making money, I suggest so you're, so you're, that you're already, that you, so you're already saying that your, your, your business, whatever you're doing now is a scam. You're not, I mean, if you're not making money, then what are you doing? If you're okay, not making okay. money, then what hold, are you doing? Hold on one second, That's Ben it. and Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, can, can we hear their presentation first? Oh, please, please go, go ahead. So this is his Academia page, yeah, independent, not academia.edu, like me also, Wolfgang Thiel, and this is Buddy's uh, economic, uh, sorry, Buddy Wells, actually, .wordpress.com. Uh, what happened here? Okay. Uh, you, can, you can see, he also has a Patreon page, which you can find the link to here, I think. Patreon page? Yeah. What's the link for the Patreon page, sorry? Is it, is it at the top, or...? Buddy, can you can you uh, say quickly the link to your Patreon page? Apparently, uh, it's not on your website. It's on your Twitter. I think. It's it's at the top left. So if you okay, one moment. You oh, go okay. to the top where the picture is. It, it, is it okay basically. if I send you guys the link to my OnlyFans account as well? It, it'll be very good for networking. <laughs> hey, definitely oh. not. Stuart knows an OnlyFans account. He's a dirty boy. Oh my lord! All right, all right. So this is Buddy's uh, right. Twitter page, yeah. So he's interested in job guarantee and MT, uh, or at least he has the, those hashtags, pay gap, moderation, profit sharing, and uh, blockchain democracy. Yeah? Uh, not, not, not Bitcoin, but blockchain. Yeah? And this is, uh, uh, so he was, yeah? So this is his website, and base, basis the wordpress.com. And you can see here permanently, uh, uh, ban permanent banner on his website uh, on corruption. Yeah, are you sure that 2009? Oh, this is 2009. In fact, I'm just gonna rip on quickly. That's all right. Election uh, will give birth to a government that is anti-corruption. So you can see corruption is a, some sort of a permanent issue for post-colonial countries. So he has 7,000 followers on his Facebook. He's not that active on Twitter, and we have disseminated information to this webinar far and wide, and we are very uh, interesting participants here, as you can see from the comments. Yeah, I hope uh, we can mute our speakers while the presenters are presenting their presentation. So Wait, that mom, how do we do that? Which button do we click? Sorry. Uh, let me mute your speaker for you. I can do it. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do okay. It. All right. So without further ado, uh, despite or thank you for the interruption. Please, Wolfgang, uh, the screen, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, well, um, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare anything, so I'm probably going to have to improvise a little bit here. Um, but I'm going to use some of the slides that, that you probably already have seen and maybe just elaborate a little bit on them. And um, maybe it's easiest if I share my screen because then you all can see the slides. I'm just going to try and do that here. Um, It's not working yet. I think you may have to activate that for me. But in the meantime, um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, is the audio okay? All right, great. Because yeah, we I can, can hear you. It's good. It's good. It's good. Thank you. I, I have, great. I have uh, activated the multiple screen sharing feature, so you can share your screen uh, with them. Thanks. Cool. Okay. So let me full size this. If I can do that, and then we can get started. All right. Okay. So, well, th first of all, thanks very much for inviting me to such an interesting uh, round of people here. Um, uh, I was uh, I didn't know any of you before, but I saw Buddy is a musician, a jazz musician. That's really great. I love music too, and <laughs> uh, play a little bit of drums and piano also. And so um, it's interesting that in this field of alternative economics, um, with people who are trying to do something a little bit different, a little bit new, you meet a lot of musicians. We have a lot of musicians in our little organization as well. <laughs> um, so uh, that felt really good. Um, but um, maybe to get right into the matter, um, first of all, I have to say that the, the whole topic of corruption um, was not something that was originally on my list of questions that I was trying to answer. Um, 
I was really trying to understand capitalism as a whole as compared to socialism and also the transitions from one system to another historically. Um, because I grew up in a divided country that was half uh, socialist and half uh, capitalist. So I was constantly in the middle of these ideological debates, uh, which were raging during my teen years. And um, that was uh, I'm, I'm mainly sorry, the, 19, what, what the 1980s. Country was that? What, what that country was, was that? Germany. Oh, Germany. <laughs> Are you like East and West Berlin and all that stuff? That, that's amazing history. So did, right you fight for the, did you fight for the good guys or the bad guys? Like which, which side were you um, sort of? Uh, sorry. Maybe, maybe, I... maybe I'll finish my presentation yeah. first and we put the questions sorry. in at the end. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, but I think this is a very important um, part of, of the presentation, though. I think I, I think we sort of need to know really sort of which which side you're on because I can't really support you if you were for the bad guys, Wolfgang. You know what I mean? All right, all right. I will take the policy to uh, mute you guys first, and later you can. Uh, of course, uh, of comments. course. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll mute myself. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, right. Wolfgang. Yeah. All right. Um, so. Um, uh, I started out um, in, in the early 90s um, going completely against the stream reading Marx, actually, because I got a chance to at Berlin Free University. Um, and at that time, nobody was reading that, um, which was actually a pretty good atmosphere because it was really quiet. And there were some radical lefties around there, but I didn't really engage with them too much. Um, I spent time reading Capital. And um, after that, I tried to understand uh, what had happened with socialism. Um, and um, so this is actually the origins of the list of questions that I then developed when um, I read Marx. And um, well, when I finished my studies, I had to put that whole topic a little bit on the, on the back burner for a couple of years because I was doing other projects and I also had to think about how to make money. Um, and um, with the financial crisis, then finally came a time when the atmosphere was a little bit better for doing things like that. And I met a lot of people who were also interested in the sort of questions that I was interested in around money and monetary economics. Um, and um, then I took up the project again and spent about five years between 2013 and 2017, 18, um, working on that very intensely. And that whole topic of corruption um, was something that um, sort of came about by accident. Um, I stumbled upon, uh, upon that when I was trying to uh, understand how um, the institution of a state, of a centralized authority, which is an institution which both uh, socialism and capitalism shared, um, came about historically. Um, and how it could be possible that uh, people would accept such a centralized authority when um, we still have around the world a lot of tribal communities that do not have such a centralized authority and do not really seem to need it. They don't develop it by some evolutionary automatic mechanism by themselves. Um, usually they just adopt it when it comes in from the outside. So um, that was the question that I was going after really and um, as I was looking for um, interesting literature on the topic, um, around 2013, I stumbled upon a book by Francis Fukuyama called Origins of Political Order. And uh, I was very surprised to find something like that by an author um, like Fukuyama, who was associated with the end of history thesis and so on. And um, I was a little bit reluctant, but when I got the book and looked at it a little bit more closely, I thought this was very, very interesting because uh, Fukuyama presented a uh, really a global comparative history of this institution called a state. And his um, interest in doing that was really uh, development and transition economics because he had uh, been working as, a, as an advisor or as a development coach for various countries. And um, he had realized um, he didn't really know anything about how these institutions that we have in modern capitalism and mainly in Western Europe, which developed mainly in Western Europe, how these historically actually came about. And well, if you know nothing about their history, how they actually came about, how are you supposed to tell anyone else how to create those institutions? Um, and this is what prompted him to take a very broad based um, 
comparative look uh, at the history of this uh, institution, uh, the state. And um, to me, this was um, important because, um, oh, well, okay, I, maybe I won't go into that. I have to cut things a little bit short here. Um, maybe I go to the next slide. Okay, maybe I start by saying that um, usually corruption is a term that is used in a moral way. Um, corruption is something that the bad guys are doing, right? We, we already heard that. Somebody who is, um, who I don't like basically is doing something bad um, and um, this guy is corrupt and, and we are the good guys. So this is the the usual way the word is used with, in a moral sense. But I'm gonna try and take a little bit more um, a bird's eye view on corruption, as I call it, a, a very broad comparative perspective on that and conceptualized that whole uh, phenomenon a little bit different um, in this whole context of economic development and of transition to modern capitalism, quote unquote. Um, but um, what I'm showing here is the very popular slide in these corruption debates at the Transparency International Corruption Index uh, has a worldwide map um, with how corrupt uh, people in these countries perceive their countries to be. And um, we can basically see that the, these kind of the countries where uh, we have uh, the, the most developed economies, um, the, the level of corruption, according to this uh, presentation at least, uh, seems to be the lowest. And um, I had also looked at other kinds of maps, um, world maps, um, in my economic studies. For example, the property I mean, rights I index. Sorry, I, I, don't know, I don't know, Wolfgang, if I'm, if I'm drunk, yes. I'm really stoned, but it doesn't really sound like any, anything you're saying is really making much sense. So I'm just going to leave on that note because it seems like everything's like waffle. It's, it's, it's 20 minutes of just complete garbage. So I, thank you, but sorry, I've got to go. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I completely agree. I completely yeah, agree. I think that's a good decision. Bye. See you guys. See, see but, you guys. By the way, what country is that in South America at the very, at the very north? Why is that one red? Is that Venezuela? Colombia? Venezuela, yeah. Okay, is, is that uh, a corrupt country? One moment, Ben. Uh, can we wait until the end of the presentation to provide our comments? <laughs> My bad, of course, of course. Sorry, sir. All right. Um, so the usual thing then uh, liberals are probably going to say is, okay, uh, we can see a pretty good correlation between strong property rights and low levels of corruption. So what we need to do is we need to strengthen prop property rights in all these countries. That would be like from this ideological liberal point of view, um, a typical way to, to interpret these two uh, maps here. But if you look at the next map, um, which is the fragile state index, um, we can see also a pretty good correlation of the level of corruption with um, strong and institutionally reliable states. Now, this is something that your typical liberal is probably not gonna look at that much and he's not gonna uh, see that correlation because to him, the state, of course, is the source of corruption, right? And uh, you have to cut back on the state and so on to cut back on corruption and strengthen pro property rights and you will get economic development. Um, that was the whole Washington consensus story that was being pushed uh, through, on through the 80s um, up, almost up um, to the financial crises. Um, but um, this uh, slide then could actually have you scratch your head and that's what Fukuyama then also noticed. Fukuyama noticed that um, for uh, having strong property rights and having this uh, uh, dynamic development that many countries seem to strive for after the model of um, Western Europe essentially, um, you also need to have strong and reliable state institutions. And um, so what we were trying to do in our project was to conceptualize the basic institutions that Western civilization, European civilization or capitalism, quote unquote, is based upon um, and uh, start from the legal side of that 
And then, and this was inspired by Marx also, compare this to stateless communities that do not have centralized authorities and first try to get really clear what are the similarities and the, dif the differences of these very different ways that people can relate to each other when they organize their social reproduction essentially. Um, and um, this is the map that we uh, eventually came up with um, to conceptualize that and um, all right, I'll try to cut it a little bit short um, because I have I don't I don't want to take up too much of your time. But you see these two arrows here. Um, there is one arrow between private law and public law, and another arrow between uh, the left hand side called non law um, or, or custom, which is essentially dealt with by legal anthropology and deals with stateless communities, um, and the field where it says on the bottom, law, European civilization. And these was to describe um, very basic conflicts inherent in um, this type of civilization, European civilization, that is world civilization these days, today, but is actually a very historically specific form of organizing social relationships and is by no means natural. Um, and uh, all right, um, I know all of this may sound a little bit abstract and not, uh, you know, if, you, if your only goal is to make money by talking about Bitcoin and so you, you're not gonna get anything about, uh, out of this. Um, but I hope um, for some of you at least, there will be some, some uh, takeaway um, of this. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm coming from, from, from the result now of, of the project that we did over these five years, 2013 to 2018. Um, what we found missing in most economic theories and most theories of Western civilization is um, a conceptualization, conceptualization of these basic conflicts which seem to be inherent in this system and that um, seem to be sort of um, defining aspects of the system of Western civilization. The private versus public law side is essentially the conflict between um, decentralizing of uh, decision-making of power of planning and capitalism by way of private law, property rights and contract versus centralization of decision-making and um, power through the state, um, the defining characteristic of which is that it has the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force, right? So, and this is also the um, conflict between consent versus command and the conflict between freedom of contract versus subordination under government. And uh, our core result would be that you need both to have capitalism. Um, whereas you have these different ideological positions that uh, make a distinction between the good guys and the bad guys here. Either you're a liberal, then you know the green print, the private law side and freedom is all the good stuff and the, the red side, the state, you know, that's all the bad stuff that you've got to do away with. Uh, whereas on the socialist side, sometimes people tend to be more on the state side and want to cut back on the free market because that also has its uh, problems and uh, its um, inherent instabilities. Um, and um, from our perspective, it's good to conceptualize this contradiction and to bring that into the theory explicitly into the model of capitalism, to get beyond these ideological debates. So this was for me an important result in trying to understand the whole ideological debate that raged during the Cold War in my teenage years, um, because it was all around this contradiction, right? Um, but now, uh, <laughs> I need to get to the whole topic of corruption. Um, and because that's the, the topic of today's webinar, but it was just something that I stumbled upon <laughs> um, trying to understand uh, capitalism as such. And also I'm coming here from the result that we mainly have taken from uh, the work of Frank Fukuyama, um, which is a two volume uh, series that he put out in 2011 and 2015 on the comparative history of the state as an institution um, and um, 
the first volume is called Origins of Political Order, and there's the second volume is called Political Order and Political Decay. And, um, sorry, to go back to that one. Um, so the other big uh, conflict or contradiction that is really not, um, from our point of view, um, something that you can do entirely away with as long as you have capitalism is the conflict between personal reciprocity and gift exchange based upon kinship and friendship, um, which is sort of the traditional default way of how human beings relate to each other, even if there is not a state. And a state is not a natural institution. It's a, it's a historical product, it's a historically relative institution. Um, and once you don't have a state, people have to rely on this form of interpersonal exchange, personal reciprocity, gift exchange, um, based upon kinship and friendship. In other words, on knowing people personally. And on the other side, you have relations that are organized by impersonal legal rules, um, private and public law, um, which is essentially the tradition of Roman law, at least in Western Europe. And common law is really not so much different from that in its basic institutions, even though it looks very different on the surface. Um, and merit, in other words, performance, right? Best performance. These two ways people relate to each other can be in conflict as well. And from our point of view, it's the tension between these two. There's a field of tension between these two where this whole phenomenon of corruption then sort of arises when people who are expected to decide on, on the basis of impersonal laws and merit and best performance, then decide based upon these traditional criteria. So one example would be Donald Trump giving the best job in the White House to his son-in-law, right? So everybody says that's, that's corruption, right? And because in, in that context, somebody would be expected to adhere to the formal law and rules and recruit people based upon what they can actually do, right? Um, but um, I'm not judging this here. Um, I'm just trying to describe this and to conceptualize this conflict. So it's not about wh what's the good side or the bad side, really, but uh, first grasping this, this conflict. And all right, so this would be so sort of the basic way that we try to, to conceptualize this whole phenomenon of corruption that I could now go into much more detail about um, and that Frank Fukuyama goes into in uh, much more detail about too. Um, but I think that would be too, too long, right? We don't have um, enough time for that. Maybe I take a little break now and um, just see whether you can, you know, what, what you're make of this, whether you can take anything of this or whether you have any questions um, at this point, um, because I'd rather talk with you than just talk at you, right? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, I, I ha just have one note. Uh, I think uh, when you say Western uh, countries, uh, as I can see here, it actually applies to mm -hmm. a lot of countries, more countries than just those classified under Western civilization. I would say uh, countries such as Indonesia and South Africa, they're also part of this Western or at least Westernized civilization. So it also applies to them. So, okay, it's fine. I think you can uh, stop here. I think we can continue with Buddy and later with uh, Sohibul and then you can uh, represent later. I'm flexible with the, with the format. So perhaps you can stop the screen sharing so Buddy can start his presentation. Sure. Yeah. Um. So for your information, uh, uh, some participants have suggested that I block Ben and Liam. Uh, apparently they have left on their own accord and I saw Ben try to re-enter, but I didn't allow them. So I think we can have a much more enjoyable presentation for you, buddy. <laughs> Sorry, Wolfgang, for just now. <laughs> Please. Hi. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, thanks, Syria, for, for, for having me on this webinar. Um, and uh, yeah, Wolfgang, thanks very much for what you were saying. I really got something from um, the way you described the almost opposing um, dynamics that drive 
something like um, the, the 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 something like corruption and, and how uh, the the value systems that we have are kind of um, there's there's a lot of different ways to look at the same um, thing you know because the the world is is very uh, it's got a, you can you've always got a lot of ways to look at things and I think that's you really made me think about that now. So thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, let me just uh, share. Let me see. Share that. Okay. So um, yeah, thanks, Suri. I just uh, as 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 Volkan was saying that we didn't have much time to prepare for this. I've actually never done a little webinar webinar like this. Um, uh, it's my first time, so. Uh, it's been a good learning experience for me, and uh, for the first time, I'm going to try do some some slides on the PowerPoint thing, and uh, so that's great. You know, we all learn, and we we. I was I was I was contemplating just improvising because that's what I do when I play music, and I thought maybe I'd be better at doing that. But then I thought, why not just uh, give it a give it a go? So anyway, here's my uh, attempt at that. I hope you guys will. And then uh, bear, bear with me. So, okay. Um, where do we start? So, 30 years ago, uh, I was a teenager. I won't give you my exact age, but uh, Nelson Mandela was released. Uh, and so, it was 1991. Um, actually, 1990, I think. Um, and yeah, uh, he, he he was released from from prison, and he, he went to make a speech in town in the town hall in Cape Town, and I was actually one of I went to go watch him um, make the speech. We were all very excited about this prospect. Nelson Mandela uh, was going to lead the country into this uh, prosperous new era where every, we were going to reduce inequality and poverty and unemployment, all this kind of stuff, and lived together in harmony, all the races, and uh, yeah, everyone was very optimistic about it. And so um, that's, the, that's the picture of the day that I'm somewhere in that audience, in the crowd there. Uh, 30 years later, this is the, the situation for most of South Africans. Um, most South Africans still live in really terrible poverty. Um, South Africa is the most unequal country in the world. And um, yeah, we've, uh, we haven't come very far. That's in the last 30 years. And uh, in my 20s, you know, as I said, in the, when, when Nelson Mandela was released during the 90s, there was such an optimism and people thinking that we were going to make changes and everything's going to get better. And then as the years went by, I started to realize like, you know, things aren't really changing. Um, for most of our people, things are staying the same. And I started to wonder why, why that is, why, why are we not moving forward? Um, because we were following the, the advice of all these big econom economists from overseas telling us what we should be doing. And, um, and I started looking into that. Um, and trying to figure it out. And that's kind of how I came across, because I'm a musician. I started kind of analyzing things myself. And one of the things that I noticed was that the way that we are, the things that we are told to do in, in developing world, or South Africa particularly, and the way that we look at economics is very different to how people in developed worlds, um, how they, view economics and the things that they do. For instance, the central bank, uh, the things that the central bank does is very different in developed world compared to in South Africa. Um, and I started to look into that. Um, and so uh, in this picture here of Nelson Mandela giving his speech, you'll see the man that's holding uh, the microphone there, that's um, President Soro Ramaphosa, who's president right now. Um, and he was 
the the man that dealt with uh, formulating the economic side of the negotiations and the changes that were put in the structures that were put in place. Um, Nelson Mandela was really, and and some other people were very um, influential on the political side. So he was more influential on on our. Um, we, we have a constitution which is really highly regarded uh, and um, we've got political freedom for most people. But in terms of the econo economic side of stuff, uh, there's not much freedom. I mean, there's, there's not much economic freedom. There's not much wealth. That's, there's a lot of inequality and stuff. And um, Sol Ramaphosa was the man, uh, a few people that he was working with, but they put together this uh, system, economic system that we have now, which is very uh, influenced by neoliberal um, economists. Uh, you were saying the Chicago School, Wolfgang. Um, yeah, so at the time, and I mean, interesting enough, uh, this is about that this photo was taken is very, very close to when the Berlin Wall fell down, which I think was in 1989, is that right? If I recall correctly. So um, this was like a few, literally a few months later that Nelson Mandela made the speech. Um, the Russian Federation around about the same time, uh, the, Ru the Soviet Union uh, became, the communism ended, it became capitalist. And neoliberal econom economist was like very triumphant. They were, it, capitalism was, you know, they were, they were it was like this, zenith of, of that whole capitalist ideology. And so South Africa was kind of bought into this um, idea that we should have a neoliberal system, free markets, open up our, um, our industries, open up our markets, our financials, um, markets and stuff like that. So in the 1990s, South Africa opened up its economy, capital controls were relaxed, the rand was floated, on the market and uh, some state-owned industries were privatized quite cheaply, they were sold quite cheaply to the private sector. And uh, procurement of, by government was decentralized so that um, officials all over the country could procure from the private sector. So um, up till that point, the government was doing a lot of the stuff itself, like in-house uh, government departments would be building roads and constructions, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if they, if they did have to outsource to a private company, there was a central uh, board in, in Pretoria, which is, was called Pretoria at the time, um, that, that dealt with all of that. Only one, one board that dealt with the whole country. And then um, the Minister of Finance at the, um, in, the, in the late 90s was um, Trevor Manuel. And he basically liberalized the whole thing and he allowed all government departments to procure their own services from the private sector. And so what that did was that expanded the, the tender system and created a much larger, unbalanced, lightly regulated market um, in which government officials um, could trade public money, which they had no stake in, with private companies who stood to make billions should they get um, a contract from, from the state if they could get a tender from them. So, um, the, I mean, when I, when I kind of thought about that, I realized that there's a real flaw in that system because normally you can't really, uh, in, 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 a private, in the private sector transaction, you've got two people, um, You've got a bad, it, it's balanced because you have uh, both the seller and the buyer have a stake in the goods and services being sold and the money being used to buy them. But when you have a tender uh, contract being offered to the private sector by the state, you have government official that's trading with money that's not, that's not there. So they, they, they've got no stake in it while the companies can make billions. So it's, it's a very uneven, unbalanced uh, market and so you you need to have a lot more control over that and a lot more um, oversight and the whole idea of having a free market and that's kind of you know it just doesn't make sense and um, 
So, uh, I just not can't really see the screen properly. Let me put this to the side. So, the media um, and the anti corruption agencies, uh, political parties, and general public uh, tend to make the fight against corruption about certain individuals, um, but it's a systemic problem. So, um, instead of, instead of uh, people identifying that there's a problem with, with the way that we've set the whole system up, what's been happening is that uh, the media and everyone focuses on the individuals. So it's, oh, he's, he's a problem. He's, he's doing corruption. And if we can get rid of him, we're going to sort corruption out. And then we get rid of that guy. And then the next person comes in and then the corruption stays the same because even uh, because it's so decentralized, even if you change the president or something, there's so many, it's happening all over the place. So it's very difficult to keep, keep a handle on it or just to deal with certain individuals. So I think that's one of the main problems is that um, we're not identifying the systemic problem and talking about it. And then, um, so I started thinking about solutions for it. And, uh, I thought of this kind of idea of having this uh, gateway legislation that would um, ensure that public sp spending um, does what it's supposed to do, which is reduce poverty, inequality, and unemployment. And, um, and so uh, setting up a, a legislation that reduces corruption, inefficient, wasteful expenditure, and ensures that uh, money is spent efficiently on providing services and infrastructure. And it's kind of based on, I like to, um, in when I explain my concepts, I try to think of them in ways that um, people who are uh, have been brought up with the more neoliberal free market ideologies can latch onto them. So one way that I like to present this to to uh, people from those schools is to say that this is kind of like an ethical consumerism. Um, you know, because most capitalists will actually like grab that concept and go, okay, ethical consumerism. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, it's a market thing. Uh, citizens, because we are, it's our money that's being spent. Um, it's public money. So we have a, a, a right and a responsibility to make sure that as consumers, that we, that our money is spent in the most beneficial way for our planet, for us, for our people, all that kind of stuff. So in that way, um, legislation, um, can actually be seen from a market perspective, which I think Wolfgang, maybe you could also, uh, you just made me think about that as well, because that's that balance between the free market and the, the state, you know, and finding, finding the right balance between that. Um, so, one of the things that I thought obviously makes a lot of sense is to build a capable state that outsources less. So, um, one recent um, example that happened in South Africa, which is quite funny, is uh, uh, sad and funny, is, is like, there was an example, a very publicized example of, of a border fence with Zimbabwe um, that the state outsourced to a private company to build this fence. And of course, the, the private company overcharged them by a whole lot, it was tens of millions. Um, and um, which, and then it just made me think: Why is the state outsourcing to a private company to build a fence? Because I mean, if you think of like <laughs> anybody can build a fence, you don't need to outsource to a private company to do that. So obviously, one of the things, I and mean, there's so many examples of that: um, build a capable state that that outsources less. That's that makes a lot of sense. And then the second one would be uh, for the state only to procure from South African owned companies. Um, because the most public spending that remains within our economy and is spent onwards within our economy, it increases the fiscal multiplier, it increases demand. Um, you want to keep the money flowing within the economy. As soon as the state pays straight away outside of the economy, that immediately reduces the fiscal mul multiplier and it increases the current account deficit. And the current account deficit, if you into economics, you understand that. 
you reduce the current account deficit, then you're also going to reduce your future debt because the current account is basically what's driving your, your debt. So, um, and if you can reduce your debt, you allow for lower interest rates, that kind of stuff. So it's really beneficial for the government to be spending uh, money on South African companies instead of overseas companies. And what's actually been happening is that the South Africa, South African government's been outsourcing a lot to overseas companies, the foreign companies to do stuff that's really unnecessary. I mean, one example, very highly publicized example in South Africa is um, we have this eToll system on our roads uh, in, um, in Johannesburg where um, the, the state used to collect money to build roads from a levy on, on fuel. So when you go to the, the fuel pump, you put money in, you pay a, a levy on fuel, and that's the, the, the revenue service of the state would collect money and the, that money would be used to build roads. Somehow, we don't know how this was convinced, but I mean, how, how they convinced the state to do it, but then you can imagine how people convince officials to do stuff. Uh, an Austrian company convinced uh, the, the state to let them uh, collect money for building of roads to, by using um, an e-toll system, which is like an electronic tolling system that captures you as you're driving through it. And it cost the country, um, the South Africa pays that Austrian company, it's, it's billions of, of rands um, over, over years. So instead of just letting the state collect money for, um, for, for building of roads through the normal tax system, they privatized that pay the Austrian company to do it quite unnecessarily. Um, and in what that did was it just drove up the current account deficit and drives up our debt in doing that. And then the, uh, the next thing I'd, I would say was, would be a good way to reduce uh, corruption is to, to put a cap on the maximum pay within, uh, within the states and within companies that the state procures from and that grants the li exclusive licenses too. So we've got these companies that, um, you know, they're making, the, the state is spending tri literally trillions uh, of rands um, a year. And um, a lot of that is procuring from private, private companies. Um, and one way to reduce um, the corruption, and there's a whole lot of other benefits which I'll get into now, is to, is to just put a cap on the maximum pay. So that's, that just allows um, less ways for people to launder money and that kind of thing. The companies um, that the state procures from and grants exclusive license to should pay all their workers a living wage. Because, um, that's a, so if, you, uh, if the state was to, to hire people to do stuff, they would normally pay them a much better wage than what workers are getting in these companies that are getting outsourced, that the, the state is outsourcing to. Because what's happening is that the state outsources, the workers get less and a few people get billions because they're putting them, you know, they're taking money for themselves. Um, companies doing businesses with the state don't make excessive profit from tender contracts. So that's just to say that in the same way, you know, if, you, if you're getting business from the state, you shouldn't be making excessive um, profits from that as a, as a company. Obviously, investors, shareholders must make a decent profit to encourage investment in private sector and that kind of thing. But the profit from the public tenders should not be excessive. Um, okay, I mean, I could go on. Maybe we should, we should stop there and, and, and move on because I don't want to... I have, I have a, a, a whole lot of benefits of this that I can get into later, but let's, let's call it, let's, let's start there for now. Thank you very much, uh, Buddy. Uh, uh, I've noted uh, some points here. Unfortunately, what you have described, for example, in Indonesia itself, has not been a mainstream discussion among, among intellectuals who are interested in corruption. Uh, well, not only the public, but the intellectuals. Uh, 
uh, is actually a much more systemic problem, even uh, super systemic, if, if I may say. If we later go on to Wolfgang's presentation, he actually has Zimbabwe is the main slide in his presentation that I was uh, referring to that he said just now. So I have lots of comments here. For example, uh, how about the borrowing uh, in dollars? Yeah? I think that is also actually, to my mind, a source of huge corruption, uh, which we can talk about later. Sorry, Surya. Uh, yes. I'm getting I'm getting a, a an echo. I think maybe one of uh, maybe uh, Schäuble's so uh, mics on or something like that. Okay. Can you hear me clearly? Clear yes, enough. Yeah, better. Could you hear what I said just now? I was yeah. Just if you could just the last part. Okay. Like for example, you see corruption. I think in post-colonial countries, I love that term more instead of developing and develop, because the World Bank itself has uh, did away with the term, done away with the term. They, did, no, no, they no, no longer use it. They use low income, uh, middle income, and high income countries more now, uh, and some other terms. But uh, just to make it clear, uh, one woman, yeah? Uh, colonial and post-colonial countries, post-colonializing and post-colonialized countries for most countries in the world, uh, and some other terms, I think, uh, which we can use. Uh, but that's the term that I use. So what I was saying that in terms of uh, the, the huge corruption, which is, uh, as we know, between states uh, or between jurisdictions, you know, as Wolfgang has shown in his slide, uh, the third and fourth on the right side, I think later we can discuss more about it, which nobody uh, or no agency or no uh, uh, some sort of uh, global, no global organization actually has mandate or has legal force to, to, to deal with it. I think we can talk more about it later. And respectively, or subsequently, or following that, uh, one topic that of interest is uh, the borrowing of dollars uh, to post-colonial countries such as South Africa. I was very surprised when you said that actually the government is going to uh, borrow dollars, but the dollars will never leave the Federal Reserve. They, they'll just convert the dollars to run in South African Central Bank and use that. Uh, so I think we can talk about that uh, later. So it's actually a process or uh, a means uh, for, uh, uh, I'm not sure how can I link it later, but I think it's also part of this uh, corruption to make sure that the state, the South African state remain entrenched in the uh, ideology of neoliberalism or becoming forever dependent on other countries, such as the United States. So I think we can discuss that later. If, if my point is not clear, I can repeat it later. Now let's have uh, Pak Sohibul. I think he will present in Indonesian. Uh, he has lots of pictures and di uh, diagrams, so you, you can roughly, I think, understand what he means. And also I can help translate later, but after his presentation. So Pak Sohibul, uh, the screen is yours, yeah? Okay, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everybody. I'm not so very fluent in English, but uh, let me express it. myself in Indonesia. And maybe Mr. Suya can help me to translate uh, from my speech. Saya punya apa di sini? Ya. Yeah. What? Slash. Slash. Oke, oke. Ya. Saya kira korupsi itu ada di mana-mana. Uh, lalu setiap orang mungkin memiliki sifat double talk atau omong ganda. Saya tampilkan slide pertama ini untuk menunjukkan bahwa beda korupsi di negara maju mungkin lebih canggih, high density, dan kemudian di negara berkembang lebih vulgar, lebih kasar. Tapi semua sama-sama doyan korupsi. 
apakah ada kaitan antara korupsi di negara satu dengan negara yang lain? Tentu ada. Apalagi dalam kaitan antara negara yang maju dengan negara terbelakang, kalau istilah itu masih boleh digunakan. Sesungguhnya, title saya lebih berpusat pada hal-hal yang sifatnya lokal. Pengalaman Indonesia. Ada mitos yang diperpegangi dalam pemberantasan korupsi, dan saya kira mitos itu telah membuat Indonesia tidak pergi ke mana mana dalam pemberantasan korupsinya. Itu yang akan saya jelaskan. Tentu saja perlu membuka pembahasan tentang bagaimana kaitan korupsi di negara seperti Indonesia dengan negara-negara lain. Indonesia negara yang memiliki sejarah yang khas, yang menjadikan, dan dia tidak cukup independen untuk menentukan nasibnya. Dalam waktu beberapa menit ke depan, saya akan berusaha menguraikan itu se setingkat mungkin. Uh, ini adalah pola pengukuran yang secara sepihak didominasi oleh negara-negara besar. Yang kalau kita kritik, ukuran-ukuran uh, persepsi itu sama sekali tidak sama. Padahal korupsi di negara-negara berkembang, negara-negara yang kurang maju, itu banyak didesain oleh negara-negara besar dengan segenap pengaruh dia. Bahkan tidak hanya soal uang. Bahkan pemerintah di negara-negara lemah itu pun terkadang diinstal oleh negara-negara maju. Saya kira itu bukan rahasia umum. Hanya saya kita agak malu-malu atau mungkin takut mengakuinya. Terkadang di negara-negara tertentu muncul sebuah populisme tokoh yang bergerak untuk menantang korupsi. Tetapi, karena dia diinstal oleh pihak lain di luar, nasibnya juga hanya berakhir pada wacana ke wacana. Tidak ada hasil sama sekali. Memang dia untuk saat tertentu akan dipuja, puji oleh sejumlah orang, dan di barikade, dirawat, dan didukung, dieluk-elukan, tapi dia tidak punya hasil apa-apa. Indonesia sejak zaman Bung Karno sudah memiliki banyak lembaga uh, pemberantasan korupsi, tetapi tidak memiliki hasil apa-apa. Hingga sekarang kita memiliki apa yang disebut dengan Komisi Pemberantasan Korupsi, berubah bentuk berjilid-jilid, makin lama, makin ke sini, makin tidak efektif nyaris tidak memiliki daya upaya lagi. Ini adalah satu gambaran tentang bagaimana problem pemberantasan korupsi di Indonesia. Kita tahu dengan teori power and superab, mestinya orang yang paling korup adalah yang memiliki kekuasaan besar dan memiliki akses terhadap segala sumber daya. Tapi di Indonesia, mitos yang dikembangkan Daerah lebih korup dari pusat, legislatif lebih korup dari eksekutif, birokrasi pemerintahan lebih korup dari dunia usaha, opini umum lebih penting dari prestasi kerja, lembaga penegak hukum konvensional dipandang sebagai borok nasional, karena itu perlu diabadikan lembaga seperti KPK. Walau sama sekali tidak lagi memiliki sepak terjang yang meyakinkan kita. Penegakan hukum atas korupsi bukan untuk mengejar indeks dan pujian yang dibuat oleh negara asing, melainkan untuk menjamin bahwa uang rakyat tidak disalahgunakan. Prinsip ini yang sama sekali tidak diinginkan oleh lembaga penegak korupsi. Jika kita ingin benar dalam memberantas korupsi, maka inti kekuasaanlah yang harus kita utamakan bersih-bersih dan terbebas dari masalah korupsi. Lalu para pembantu inti kekuasaan, para menteri, dan lain sebagainya. Lembaga-lembaga penegak hukum konvensional, dunia usaha dalam dalam maupun luar negeri, include BUMN dan BUMD. Kita orang Indonesia 
sangat tahu persis bagaimana kinerja BUMN itu dan BUMD itu. Lalu kemudian cabang-cabang kekuasaan lainnya. Inilah urutan-urutan dari kekuasaan yang akses terhadap korupsi berdasarkan struktur pemerintahan kita. Mestinya benar harus seperti itu. Lalu KPK ini dulu pernah punya apa yang dinamai dengan LHKPN. Uh, tapi data-data kekayaan pejabat negara itu tidak pernah dijadikan sebagai dasar untuk penelusuran apakah seseorang korupsi atau tidak. Padahal itu data yang sangat mengganggu. Dan sekarang itu nyaris tidak digunakan lagi. Karena itu sifat pemberantasan korupsi itu lebih banyak lebih bersifat politis, rasanya seperti itu. Walau mungkin akan susah, susah mengambil data tentang kebuktian itu, tapi rasanya seperti itu. Ini adalah satu contoh lain tentang bagaimana pemberantasan korupsi Indonesia. Trennya seperti apa. Sasaran korupsi itu mestinya ada dua. Pertama, uang berangkas. Itu APBD dan APBN. Kemudian uang non-berangkas. Kerugian negara akibat kebijakan pengelolaan sumber daya alam. Tetapi Indonesia lebih sibuk pada uh, uang berangkas, padahal jumlahnya sangat kecil dibanding dengan jenis korupsi yang selama ini bermaharaja lela di bidang corporate. Saya tidak tahu bagaimana, tapi saya kira lembaga korupsi kita, ya, anti korupsi kita itu tunduk pada wilayah-wilayah kekuasaan yang ditebar oleh corporate-corporate itu. Sekarang di Indonesia sedang ada apa yang disebut dengan pemilihan kepala daerah serentak secara langsung. Bagaimana itu bisa menjadi sumber korupsi? Ah, ya, karena proses itu menjadi sebuah langkah untuk hegemoni dan kemudian oligarki kekuasaan. Tidak ada satupun figur kepala daerah di Indonesia itu yang betul-betul dikehendaki rakyat karena proses pemilihannya adalah penentuan amang boru dan namboru pemilik partai di Jakarta. Dan bahasa yang digunakan untuk itu hanya dua. Pertama, how close you are to amang boru dan namboru pemilik partai. Dan kemudian yang kedua, how much money do you have? Dia akan bayar itu kemudian setelah dia berkuasa. Jadi, uang akan diperlukan untuk mendapatkan selembar kertas rekomendasi izin menjadi calon, lalu kemudian itu akan dikembalikannya nanti sebagai utang kepada orang-orang pemberi uang itu melalui eksploitasi sumber daya, APBD, dan sumber-sumber lainnya. Jadi, nyaris tak mungkin. Apakah ini bisa ditengarai? Di, di apa diantisipasi semestinya bisa semestinya mudah karena KPK itu katanya sangat rajin dan pandai uh, bikin sadap-sadapan apa pembicaraan orang di sana sini dia bisa tahu dengan fasilitas sadap itu mengapa dia takut menyadap ini saya kira kalaupun saya buat contoh di sini tentang pilkada pilpres pun pastilah seperti itu saya sudah tiba pada akhir masalah menurut saya ada empat persoalan yang betul-betul tidak bisa dilepaskan dari pembahasan korupsi di Indonesia. Pertama, terlalu lama dijajah oleh bangsa asing. Ada enam bangsa asing yang menjajah kita. Dan uh, lama penjajahan itu 350 tahun. Setelah merdeka, juga kita dieksploitasi. Pengakuan kemerdekaan Indonesia diperasaratkan dengan adanya uang macam-macam. Dan mereka tidak ikhlas Indonesia merdeka, mereka bikin prasyarat sampai dengan penguasaan sumber daya kita. Privat misalnya adalah salah satu di antara jejak yang sangat dekat dengan bagaimana hubungan kita dengan penguasa-penguasa dunia, ekspang dunia kedua itu. Jadi ini sangat kuat pengaruhnya untuk menjadi diri sendiri. Indonesia nyaris tidak mungkin. Yang kemudian, kedua, dikte negara dan lembaga-lembaga internasional Konsep-konsep, gagasan-gagasan good governance itu kelihatannya bagus. Washington Consensus itu kelihatannya bagus. Tapi good governance itu adalah bahasa lain dari bagaimana kita harus berkompetisi dan bagaimana yang kuat bisa mengambil sesuatu yang dia mau di negara-negara yang 
lemah. Katakanlah misalkan kasus uh, uh, one belt one road yang uh, digagas oleh China di Malaysia dia bekerjasama dengan uh, perdana menteri yang lama. Setelah digantikan oleh Mahathir Muhammad, Mahathir Muhammad merasa ada yang tidak beres di situ. Saya setuju. Welcome kalau kita mau bikin perdagangan bebas. Tapi saya tidak mau new kolonialism. Lalu dia datang ke Xi Jinping meminta untuk ditinjau ulang semua kontrak, penuh korupsi. Saya kira di negara-negara lain pun ini terjadi. Ada negara donor yang memprasyaratkan hal-hal tertentu dan itu koruptif. Dan sukar kita melakukan pengawasan terhadap seperti itu. Jadi andil negara-negara besar juga hal seperti itu ada. Kalau saya nggak salah, 2016, uh, anti-corruption summit yang diadakan di London, ada pembicara yang serius di situ. Debat antara David Cameron dengan uh, Muhammadu Buhari. David Cameron menuduh negara-negara seperti Afrika menjadi juara korupsi di dunia. Ini sangat uh, mengkhawatirkan kita. Tapi Muhammadu Buhari mengatakan, kondisi saya seperti ini buruknya bukan karena saya. Saya malah bisa membuat audit harta-harta stolen asset, stolen asset yang diambil oleh negara-negara besar dari negara-negara saya. Saya datang kemari dengan data-data itu. Ada tidak bertanggungjawaban bagi orang-orang yang merasa diri lebih hebat, lebih suci, tapi tidak ada konsistensi di situ. Korupsi ini milik bersama, korupsi ini kesukaan bersama, tanggung jawab bersama. Ayo kita mulai jujur. Itu contoh-contoh bagaimana diktedik di negara asing. Kemudian penjajahan oleh bangsa sendiri. Ini kalau kita lihat di dalam perundang-undangan yang dibuat di Indonesia, tadi ada disinggung oleh pembicara kedua, itu juga merupakan salah satu hal yang banyak sekali membuat kita rugi dalam pengertian proses pembuatannya juga penuh dengan intrik dan maksud-maksud tertentu penguasaan super daya setelah tidak bertanggung jawab. Bahkan untuk Indonesia, Banyak sekali undang-undang yang dibikin atas nama kepentingan lembaga-lembaga asing, negara asing, perusahaan-perusahaan asing. International Corporation itu melakukan penancapan kuku-kukunya pada Indonesia. Dan Indonesia tidak pernah bergerak. Yang terakhir adalah dominasi etnis minoritas tertentu. Kita pernah tahu bahwa di zaman Muhammad Nasir ada konsep yang disebut dengan ekonomi benteng. Itu sebetulnya adalah afirmasi ekonomi bagi pribumi. Karena selama 350 tahun Indonesia dikuasai oleh bangsa asing dan pelaku-pelaku ekonominya adalah bangsa asing, timur asing. Timur asing itu ada India, ada Arab, ada Cina. Sampai sekarang itu sangat menguasai. Kita misalkan adalah negara agraris. Karena kekuatan negara agraris itu banyak sekali negara Dari Eropa datang ke sini menjajah untuk mengeksploitasi sumber daya kita. Tetapi sampai sekarang, abad 21, Indonesia tidak cukup kuat dalam pangan. Cangkolnya pun diimpor dari Cina. Amat memalukan. Apa sebab? Karena dia tidak leluasa untuk mengelola semua aset dia. Data-data tentang tanah pun, penguasaan tanah, Indonesia tidak pernah terbuka. Karena dikuasai oleh segelintir orang. Tingkat ketimpangan, gini rasio di Indonesia luar biasa besar. Itu karena pengaruh dominasi etnis. Harus ada perubahan struktural, sehingga Indonesia itu bisa lebih sejahtera. Semua yang saya kemukakan, mulai dari yang pertama, kedua, ketiga, keempat, menyumbang secara signifikan terhadap korupsi Indonesia. Dan korupsi Indonesia itu bukanlah persoalan lokal saja, karena ada andil internasional di situ. Maaf, saya tidak begitu fasih untuk ini, Saya kira saya akhiri, mohon maaf sekali lagi pada teman-teman yang berbahasa Inggris, saya tidak cukup mahir untuk itu. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Selamat Okay, thank you very much, Pak Sohibul. Please stop your screen sharing. Oh. 
So you can press up on the right side. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let me. I have this old uh, presentation here. Uh, okay, so uh, let me translate a bit of what he said here. But he ha apparently he has modified uh, his presentation just now uh, to become shorter. So his the title is uh, "Corruption, Double Talk, and Politization." So in essence, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, okay, let me see whether I can. Okay, never mind. Uh, can you please share your screen again so that uh, I can, yeah. Uh, okay. okay, can you go to the first slide? First slide, so I can translate for you. He, he understands English, but he, I told him that he can speak in English, but he's not confident enough, yeah? So can you go to the first slide? First slide. Already? Okay. Uh, share the screen again. I have noted some of his points here. Okay. So, yeah. Second slide. Third slide. Fourth slide. Yeah. yeah. So in, in essence, I think also this is gener can be generalized to uh, many countries uh, that uh, Pak Sohibo adopts the uh, dictum or the popular saying, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So the more powerful uh, you are, the more powerful a person or an institution is, so that's where uh, the most corruption happens. So for the case of Indonesia, a lot of corruption uh, actually happens at the center of power, which is the uh, executive branch of the government, the palace, istana in Indonesia. And then, uh, as the power devolves, yeah, uh, even though the corruption cases seems to become more numerous, but the scale and the impact actually uh, is less than the corruption at the center of power. So. Uh, this is, in essence, what he tried to say. Next. So, for Indonesia, due to a huge amount of natural resources, a lot of corruption actually uh, happens at that sector. Any uh, government branch that deals with natural resources. However, so far, corruption ca cases, uh, uh, reported corruption cases, dealt with corruption cases that are that dealt with, for Indonesia revolves more around uh, a state budget and regional budget. Uh, whereas uh, those that falls under the natural resources sector, which sometimes are not uh, included in the state or regional budget, are missed by the Corruption Eradication Commission, as well as the international uh, um, uh, institutions which monitors Indonesia's corruption. And Pak as, as well as uh, me, as well as I, think that this is purposefully done because the international uh, uh, or foreign countries, uh, Western countries, European countries, the United States, Australia, they have a vested interest in extracting as much natural resources as possible from Indonesia. Therefore, they don't focus on corruption relates to uh, uh, natural resources. Uh, it is focused, but not, it, I mean, it, it is discussed about, it is talked about, but only a little as opposed to the other uh, small, relatively small corruption. So, in Indonesia, we have the misfortune, I think, now we can say it's a misfortune, of having uh, uh, a lot of political parties, tens of, uh, or even twenties, in the tens or in the twenties, uh, so perhaps 19, 20, 21 political parties, and the structure is very centralized. So uh, as you know, Indonesia is a huge country spanning the entire Europe and the entire United States, if you put it on the map, uh, if you measure the distance. 
So, but everything happens in Jakarta. So all the regional uh, politicians, they have to bribe the central politicians, the head of the political parties in order to do anything, even from the start of elections, from the uh, management of budgets, everything. Uh, so because of the centralized structure, especially in terms of finance, which is not decentralized, yeah, finance is centralized still. So uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, the, uh, the regional uh, governments, regional politicians must depend on the central uh, politicians. And these are the four uh, main reasons or main backgrounds towards corruption in Indonesia. First, uh, Indonesia has experienced uh, a long uh, process or a long period of colonization by six countries, six European countries and one Asian countries, which is Japanese. And I think Pak Sawibu will add at the moment, Indonesia seems to be slowly colonialized uh, by the uh, Chinese also because in Indonesia, the deals that they have is very much beneficial to China, uh, as opposed to Malaysia, for example, which managed to uh, uh, get a more favorable deal, uh, development, uh, infrastructure development deal than uh, Malaysia. So due to this long period, uh, as Wolfgang will say, uh, Indonesia still have, has a long way towards uh, institution, institution building, yeah? And of course, this institution building uh, is very much influenced by foreign countries and institutions such as the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank. So for Indonesia especially, uh, they actually uh, had a large say in terms of uh, Indonesia's constitutional amendments. So it could be said that they dictate to Indonesia how the constitution should be amended. Fortunately, some crucial uh, 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 articles are not amended, so they are still there. I told Buddy yesterday, for example, uh, this is my edition, yeah, that Indonesia actually guarantees job and job and livelihood. Job, uh, uh, the, uh, Indonesia actually has an article in its constitution which states that every citizen has the right to uh, uh, a job and a life with dignity. So that is hasn't been amended, and. Third reason is uh, self-colonization from the elites in Java. Uh, Javanese as an ethnic group forms a majority of Indonesia. So perhaps 60-70% uh, uh, of Indonesians are Javanese. And Java is uh, the location of power. So uh, self-colonization as in Java is colonizing the other uh, 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 regions, yeah? the outer Javan regions. Also, last but not least, the domination of certain ethnic minority, which is the Chinese. Yeah, uh, the Chinese dominates Indonesian economics. About seventy to ninety percent are dominated by them. And the Corruption Education Eradication Commission, whenever they announce corruption cases, uh, whenever they catch a politician, it is very surprising that the recipient of the bribe is always uh, publicized. Uh, greatly in the media. However, the giver of the bribe, uh, which is uh, most of the times are the uh, 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 business people, yeah, the corporate corporations, uh, be it uh, foreign or national corporations. Uh, I mean, foreign or in domestic corporations, and uh, they are seldom or less, much less publicized than the public officials. So that's it. Yeah. I think in summary, that's it. And let me see my note whether I have I left, left something. Oh yeah, he said that in 2016, there was an anti-corruption summit in London attended by a lot of countries uh, around the world. And Muhammad Buhari, then and perhaps even now, president of Nigeria said to David Cameron of uh, the prime minister of the UK that it's easy for you to say that Nigeria is the most corrupt countries in the world. But you haven't looked at, at our history. You haven't looked at how much damage, how much wealth was taken from uh, uh, Nigeria, from Africa in general, to your country. Perhaps you can, if you can read, that's the, the, the highest, or that's the uh, background of our corruption at the moment. Perhaps if you can return uh, uh, what, you have, what you have looted, what you have taken, what you have robbed from our country, then uh, we can have 
uh, more uh, funding to develop our country. And then, then you can have the moral authority to say that Nigeria is the most corrupt country in the world. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, you know, development to that idea. I think Buddy and I knows that as long as we have real resources, uh, uh, presently, we, do, we, do, we actually do not need uh, this uh, 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 so-called reparation. It's necessary, especially as a, as a moral force, yeah? but we don't need it. We can actually fulfill our constitution at the moment as long as we have our real resources available. I think that's it from me. I think Wolfgang, uh, you can continue your presentation. You can comment. You can uh, give discussions. You can criticize. Uh, and also other participants. We have a lot of questions here, which uh, you have uh, 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 the speakers and the participants have engaged on the chat. But uh, uh, we can we can add that later. Perhaps the last ten minutes of our presentation. Now, over to you, Wolfgang, to comment, criticize, ask questions, discuss uh, our uh, 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 what we have presented, what we have seen so far. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Yeah, well, thanks very much for all your contributions. Uh, that was very interesting for me. Um, and um, Buddy, I think we're, we're pretty much from the same generation. So we share that experience of ideological shifts um, within our lifetime. So in my early teens, it was the shift to uh, after the end of the Keynesian era to, to the liberal model and then the liberal overkill years of the 1990s, as I like to call them, uh, where everybody was sort of hooray, a liberal. And now we have sort of the cold turkey phenomenon after the financial crisis and people scratching their heads and thinking about strengthening the state side again. Um, but um, I would really be interested in how these ideological shifts um, were experienced in Asia and in, in Indonesia, um, especially the maybe the 1989, uh, 1990s phase, um, because I know very little about that. I just know that, for example, in China, that whole transition from the socialist system to the capitalist system was managed in a very much more gradualist way, not so much in a shock therapy way, but by taking little steps um, of sort of um, giving people more freedom, introducing private law with the government, still having a very um, strong centralized control over things. And that seems to have been much more um, successful than the, the Russian um, shock therapy um, transition. So, but I don't know uh, too much about Indonesia. I know a little bit about Japanese history, they did the transition much, much earlier, um, but maybe you can fill me in a little bit on that. So we have a more of a shared basis here. Thank you, uh, buddy. Can I answer first and you can answer after me? I, I don't know much either about um, the Indo Indonesian Asian experience. Um, I was, uh, you just reminded me of, of um, Joseph Stiglitz's book, the, uh, I think what the title of that book is, where you were saying basically the same thing about the change, um, the, the quick change to capitalism and how that really destroyed quite a lot of, not destroyed, but it, it set uh, economies back. Um, and when it was gradually managed, it, it actually uh, worked out a lot better. Um, that's, but I don't know much, so maybe someone else can, can take that right. question. Okay, I will answer, answer that. So Indonesia shifted to the Washington consensus in the 80s, uh, in the early 80s, I think. Uh, and we have had the same set of economists. Uh, 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 I mean, the same set of ide uh, neoliberal ideological uh, economists uh, uh, ruling the technocratic or the economic ministry, related ministry in Indonesia. However, at the moment, this year, for example, or lately in this decade, they have become much more pragmatic, much more uh, accepting of uh, new ideas. So for example, this year, uh, Indonesia leads the world in terms of uh, monetary financing, uh, stimulus financing, of how to uh, get the money to finance uh, the stimulus. So the Indonesian Central Bank has purchased half 
uh, of the amount of the stimulus from the Indonesian finance minister. So uh, uh, at close to effective, at effectively zero interest, as Buddy has often proposed to the central, South African Central Bank. So although the, they were the students of the neoliberal economic uh, 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 ministers uh, from the 80s, uh, who applied Washington consensus in the sense that the economy were the economy was liberalized. Lots of uh, private banks was were established, and these private banks were dominated by the Indonesian Chinese and foreign direct investments as well as other kinds of capital flooded in in the in the in the eighties. And then, however, this uh, foreign capital were not was not used uh, for productive purposes. It was used for uh, building lots of, uh, uh, how, how do you say, unsustainable projects, which showed in the late 90s uh, when uh, the Thailand or South Korea, uh, they had an exchange rate crisis. Indonesia's economy actually was sound uh, then. However, uh, lots of companies are uh, indebted in US dollars. So the investors, the foreign countries, the foreign institution, uh, foreign companies, our foreign lenders panic and they withdrew the money from Indonesia and these companies you know they had to pay uh, back their debt uh, 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 they have to answer to these foreign lenders and that's that pre precipitated the Indonesian financial crisis although the foundation of the economy was sound uh, uh, because of the uh, exchange rate crisis it had a domino effect to the rest of the economy so the real economy become affected at the moment. At that time, Indonesia was in its liftoff or takeoff uh, stage. It was building a lot of industries. Uh, uh, we had our own uh, airplane industries. So at the moment, we have Boeing, we have uh, Airbus, we have the Brazilian company. I forgot the name, but Indonesia at that time had their own uh, airplane company. And, and you know, airplane is at the top there. So if you can build an airplane, you can build cars, you can build trains, you can build ships. It can be weapons and this weapon industry uh, continues until now yeah but not the ships not the airplane not the cars and other uh, heavy uh, or industrialized uh, or other industries under manufacturing industries uh, so uh, textiles were demolished the textile industry was was demolished and uh, lots of other uh, industries uh, was demolished because the companies you know they have to pay back their debt in uh, in uh, US dollars. So we have been experiencing deindustrialization ever since the uh, late 90s, the 2000s uh, and the 2010s and at the moment we are just rebuilding that. So th those are the uh, huge uh, macroeconomic uh, aspect uh, to it. And at the moment Indonesia's foreign debt to foreign currency denominated debt to uh, national currency denominated debt, rupiah and dollars and other yen is 40% to 60%. Meaning that Indonesia owes about 40% of its debt in foreign currency and 60% of its debt in national currency. Okay, uh, is that sufficient? I can, I can talk more. What else do you want to know Wolfgang and uh, Buddy in the, in the Indonesian context here? Maybe just uh, uh, one quick question. Um, I, I know very, very little about Indonesian history. I'm sorry about that, but um, I didn't have the time to prepare to read a little bit about the history, so I have to ask questions. Um, I, I know a little bit about Vietnamese history and that in Vietnam was also a divided country um, with the communist part and then with the the southern part, uh, we know all the, the history with, you know, with the Vietnam War and so on, but this was also kind of a divided country and Korea, of course, also um, north and south was divided. Um, could you just sketch a little bit the history of, of Indonesia throughout the 20th century when this whole conflict between the socialist system, which had a total state dominance and the market-based system, which is built around private law, free markets and so on, um, developed. I mean, with 1917, that conflict really broke out, right? And then we had the Cold War, which was 
sort of this state versus market conflict all around the world. Um, and then in 1989, it seemed that the liberal side had won and so on. But could you sketch a little bit how Indonesia went through that history and um, what what the transition was like to um, like a modern society? Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Just to note, I will give the last 10 minutes to Buddy uh, because he has lots of fans here, lots of questions in the chat later, which he can answer uh, satisfactory, yeah, the last 10 minutes. So we have 10 more minutes for our own discussion, yeah. So thank you, Wolfgang, for the question. Uh, so Indonesia uh, was liberated by three forces. Uh, liberated meaning in the conventional sense of the term, yeah. Uh, there are lots of uh, discussions and issues regarding, regarding this liberation or independence. The, these three forces are the communists, the nationalists, and the religious, uh, 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 let's say, religious sector. Let's just say sector, yeah? So the religious sector, the communist sector, and the nationalist sector has uh, contributed to the Indonesian independence. So uh, the Indonesia's development or Indonesia's history in the 20th century can be roughly divided into four stages. The old order, the new order, the reformation order, and the post-reformation order. So the old order was pretty much ruled by President Sukarno, uh, 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 often uh, said as the Indonesian founding, uh, co-founding father with Hatta, yeah? two of them. And it was very much, uh, so he, he attempted to fuse these three sectors. So he has this uh, ideology called NASA Com, Na for nationalistic, Sa for uh, Nas for socialist nationalistic, A A for agama religious, and Com for communist. So he attempted to fuse these three uh, sectors into one ideology, not successfully. But it is, I think, uh, it is not as much his fault as if if his fault, yeah, as the fault of uh, the United States. So the United States were very heavily involved in Indonesian independence. We, uh, Indonesians often said that they are independent on 14, uh, of, sorry, 17 August, 1945. 17 August is like three days ago. So huge celebration here. Not that huge because of Corona, but still huge. And, but actual independence recorded in the United Nations is December 49, I think. I forgot the date. Uh, because that, those were the dates when you know, uh, the United States mediates, uh, the United States through the UN mediates between the Dutch and Indonesia. Uh, sorry, not to say Indonesia, and the regions uh, in Indonesia, uh, the uh, local states. There were a lot of local states, including uh, the Republic of Indonesia. So, Republic of Indonesia was one. We have uh, Negara Sumatera Timur, East Sumatra State. We have Negara Indonesia Timur. A Negara uh, or, or East Indonesian state, we have Negara Pasundan, Pasundan state. So we have lots of local states which were merged with the Indonesian Republic uh, through the roundtable uh, conference in uh, 48 or 49. So those were the independence date recorded in the United Nations as Indonesia's independence day. Yeah? So, after, uh, when the United States meddled into the Indonesian uh, politics, of course, the intention was to expel the communists. At that time, you know that uh, uh, that's the prelude to the Cold War, yeah? Uh, capitalists and the communists. So the United States were anxious to build some sort of a protective belt uh, throughout Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, all this. Uh, uh, Asian countries now. So they provided lots of funds, lots of intelligence, lots of help to the Indonesian anti-communist forces uh, to topple the communists. And lots of controversies about this, but in essence, in 1965, the communists were defeated. Uh, I'm not going to use, there's lots of highly charged language I can use. I'm not, I'm, I myself, I'm not partial to either the communists or the religious or the nationalists, but I'm just trying to describe uh, history here. So the communists were non-factors after 1965 in Indonesia. 
uh, the new order which were ruled mainly by Suharto, uh, General Suharto, yeah, uh, uh, in the span of 30 years. So that was the start of uh, the entry of Indonesia into the global capitalist uh, uh, stage. Yeah? So lots of foreign direct investment started in 1967 after the FDI rule was introduced, uh, Undang-Undang Penanaman Modal Asing, yeah? FDI rule, FDI law. Yeah? And uh, we have a mine, yeah? a large mine, the largest mine of gold in Papua. Uh, and Papua is a huge issue now in Indonesia. So again, another highly charged issue. Uh, given to Freeport, McMoran, or Freeport by that time, a US uh, company. And yeah, no, I believe no Western country is uh, absolved, yeah? Even Germany itself has lo lots of uh, uh, involvement in Indonesia, because simply because Indonesia has lots of natural resources. So German uh, institutions, German donor uh, institutions, German country itself, yeah. But if I may say, yeah, uh, uh, in 2001, Germany forgave Indonesia's debt, hundreds of millions, maybe 200, 300, up to 700 million, I forgot, in, in, in exchange for uh, debt for nature. So that was the scheme, I think, in exchange for natural uh, rebuilding, natural conservation. So yeah, German has, Germany then was good to Indonesia. So that was the reformation age. So I would say the reformation age from the 1998, the fall of Suharto, until perhaps 2004, yeah, before the uh, uh, general president Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono was elected. So from 1998 to 2004 was the reformation uh, process in which Indonesia underwent lots of changes in its constitution, and there are lots of complaints to these changes because uh, there are lots of changes to this uh, to this uh, there are lots of protests to these constitutional changes because. It is alleged that Indonesia is very much pro-West now, pro-capitalist now, in, oppose, in opposition to the pro-socialistic, pro-Islamist uh, 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 tone or pro-Islamic character of its constitution. So now we have the uh, post-reformation uh, uh, era or age, yeah, in which I think I would classify this uh, stage, this era, as pragmatic. Okay, lots of competing forces in Indonesia, and uh, lots of competing forces in Indonesia. And I think uh, uh, people or the politicians, uh, public figures, public elites, are just uh, trying to balance between all these competing forces. For example, uh, between the United States and China, and Japan and Australia, but mainly between the United States and, 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 and China, between uh, the uh, Islamist and the, uh, and the secularists and the communists who are uh, emerging now. Uh, uh, the descendants are making a comeback now in the national political stage. Uh, they're no longer shy about saying that I'm the sons and daughters of communists uh, uh, and lots of uh, communist events, communist meetings, uh, are being uh, uh, introduced. So I will end by saying that with all this backdrop, you know, uh, corruption remains uh, uh, a daily fixture in the Indonesian media. But my point is uh, the media, the public are missing an important part of looking at this corruption, uh, which is driven ideologically by neoliberalism, which is still having a stronghold in Indonesia, but above neoliberalism is actually uh, uh, capitalism. And ironically, ironically, uh, but this is going to be theoretical, yeah? Uh, capitalism was originated uh, from uh, Islamic history, as we discussed with them. Lots of, like, this Islamic civilization has its own system of capitalism, and this is an under-researched area which uh, I'm researching later to contribute to the discussion of how uh, the political economy understanding of uh, civilization going forward, how can, how can we, we, we contribute to it? So I think that's it from me. Uh, I'm going to give uh, the next five minutes to you, Wolfgang, 
and the last 10 minutes uh, to to I'm sorry, the next seven minutes to Pak Sohibul and uh, Wolfgang, and the last 10 minutes to uh, 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 Buddy to answer. Can you see at your chat, Buddy? You can perhaps type. And then later also you can voice out your answer. So this is it from me, uh, Wolfgang. Perhaps you can give your answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That that was very interesting to to hear. Um, maybe um, I, I can try to in 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 five minutes or so, or maybe less, uh, try to to summarize a little bit. Uh, the point of view that I'm trying to um, uh, present to you here, which is more of a, say, a bird's eye view, more of a uh, very broad based view on corruption and sketch a little bit what I think are really challenges that emerge from that for making a transition to, um, well, the kind of society that a lot of people seem to dream about, where there's low corruption, where there's a uh, reliable state where you have free markets who are not uh, going crazy, um, but are working pretty well. Um, this is what Fukuyama describes as a getting to Denmark uh, problem. And um, maybe I'll show you a couple more slides from my presentation, but only very few, and um, throw that into the discussion and then uh, we can see where that takes us. Um, I just have to find the screen share again. One second. Um, it's in the bottom middle. Yeah, okay. Yes, I found it. <laughs> okay. So, um, Maybe I, I'll give you just this overview slide, um, which helps a little bit in, in a nutshell to conceptualize uh, what I was trying to show you with um, a slide before. Um, and on what, what we see on the on the right hand side here, that would be quote unquote Denmark. Um, that would be sort of a modern uh, capitalist state uh, that has a democratic constitution um, and is overall functioning fairly well and has very uh, comparatively low levels of corruption. I think in uh, the list we saw before, Denmark was among the top five uh, in the corruption index. And on, on the left-hand side, what we see um, is sort of an idealized um, depiction of a traditional community that does not have any centralized authority, does not have any state, and therefore also doesn't have a market based upon private property and contract law but it's just based upon uh, informal reciprocity, exchange of gifts uh, between um, family members and uh, friends. And this is taken from um, a very famous book by Marshall Salins, which is called Stone Age Economics. Um, some of you may have heard of it. Um, and the, the essential point that I was trying to make is that there are these two inherent conflicts in the um, in this capitalist system. One is within the system itself, between the state and the market, or private and public law, and the other um, conflict that's much less uh, conceptualized in social theory is that between essentially what's the natural mode of human relations, um, as Fukuyama calls it, um, which is reciprocity between family members and, and friends uh, without any contract and uh, without any state interfering in these relations and this system based, up, based upon law. And Fukuyama's core result is actually that these two forms of human relations are in conflict with one another and that, for example, for the institution of a state to come about, it took a lot of historically, if we look look at it comparatively historically, unfortunately, it took a lot of violence. Um, he essentially says that um, war made the state. Um, so um, he starts actually with, with Chinese history, interestingly enough, because the Chinese were the first, in his opinion, to develop a relatively impersonal 
relatively uncorrupt uh, state very early on, much earlier than um, that kind of institution developed in Europe. And um, so uh, this transition problem from, from such a tra uh, traditional um, community to a modern society um, is actually um, a process that um, isn't very easy um, and that um, I think in part is driven by ideology so much um, and not by a real analysis of the historical development of what actually happened to bring that system about because that helps to um, sort of not become aware of all the violent processes that were involved in the creation of the system. Um, that's um, an insight that's a little bit sobering maybe, but um, Fukuyama, I think uh, he convinced me that that makes a lot of sense. And um, I just want to summarize this little bit with um, one last slide. Um, I can't do all these other slides, be way too much. But um, so these, these conflicts lead to the transitions between uh, these different systems um, to be very, um, let's say, uh, difficult um, and often um, coupled with, with violence and with power struggles. So for example, if you want to build a state, um, that also involves the quote unquote creative destruction of extremely stable traditional um, communities and forms of relations. Because in order to get people to be loyal to a state and not to be loyal to a state more than to their own family, to their own kin, um, you have to sort of separate them from their families. And that's um, a process that's not very, um, not necessarily very um, enjoyable for those people. And um, so uh, maybe that's, um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that. Um, I know that um, may seem a little bit far-fetched um, if I present it in this abstract way without all the historical background um, that Fukuyama gives to that. But maybe as a last point, um, for mm -hmm. everybody in, interested in, in this kind of view of corruption, I would really recommend these two books by Frank Fukuyama, Origins of Political Order and Political Order and Political Decay. Okay, thank you very much. I was disconnected there for a bit. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, uh, I also came across Fukuyama, uh, but uh, not because I was researching uh, corruption, uh, but because I was researching identity politics. So I got to read his uh, identity politics book and I'm a, a, a comprehensive think, uh, I like to read comprehensively on a particular thinker. So I, I got to read all his other books and I was surprised to find out that he has changed a lot of his opinions starting from the 2010s, yeah? Uh, so he wrote uh, The Origins of Political Order, Political Order and Political Decays, and then the Identity Politics book. And he has given lots of interviews uh, about the change in his uh, views. Although, of course, he still prioritized the United States, yeah, that's his country of uh, uh, residence. I think before going to Buddy, uh, let's go to Pak Sohibul first, uh, and I will translate what he says. Uh, we still have, okay, but perhaps uh, we can extend our presentation later by five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, please, Pak Sohibul. Yeah. Baik, saya ringkas saja. Harus ada uh, upaya untuk lebih memperbesar saling manfaat di antara hubungan-hubungan internasional. Uh, itu artinya orang-orang di negara-negara uh, yang lemah seperti Indonesia harus lihat uh, secara lebih manusiawi oleh negara-negara yang lebih memiliki kekuasaan. Dan sebetulnya ini harapan yang uh, sangat uh, tidak mungkin didengarkan karena urusan kita adalah how to survive. Bagaimana cara untuk menikmati lebih banyak kemakmuran, sumber daya, dan lain sebagainya itu. Dan perkelahian semacam ini adalah kalian bebas. 
Nah, saya tidak tahu rumus apa yang bisa dibuat untuk dunia yang lebih menentramkan kita, uh, memadakan uh, kondisi-kondisi dan membangun yang lebih bagus uh, ke depan. Saya kira penghargaan antara satu dan lain bangsa tidak cukup difasilitasi oleh lembaga-lembaga internasional yang ada seperti PBB, UNESCO, dan lain sebagainya itu. Nah, Suara-suara seperti ini saya kira tidak khas Indonesia, tapi negara-negara yang selama ini beroleh ketidakpuasan dalam berhubungan dengan negara-negara besar. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. In essence, uh, Pak Sohibul, I forgot to say that unlike us, he is actually uh, affiliate. He is actually a civil servant, a lecturer affiliated with the Universitas Muhammadiyah Sumatera Utara, not Sumatera Muhammadiyah University. So he's actually an academic, but a different type of economic. He's very independent. He doesn't care about state incentive and all that. He writes and writes and writes and speaks and speaks and speaks, reads and reads and reads. So he, he's not involved with academic bureaucracy and all these, you know, uh, uh, academic uh, corruption, if I may say, that we can see all around us now. So he said that, uh, in essence, he said that we need international cooperation and our existing global institutions are not enough yeah they have not first of all they themselves are not enough they themselves are not adequate and the those uh, that exist has have not dealt with the problem the root of uh, 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 corruption in the global stage uh, because most uh, 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 most let's just say post colonizing countries actually benefits from the the, the corruption it happens in post-colonialized countries. So they may be idealistic, they may be rhetorical in their uh, criticism of post-colonialized uh, uh, countries' uh, corruption. I think which a lot of our uh, participants, some of our participants, uh, Simon perhaps, are asking uh, in the chat. Yeah? And he said that he doesn't know what kind of world formula, what kind of formula we can, what kind of uh, 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 what kind of uh, uh, policies we can implement at the global stage? Because this is really uh, what we need, you know, to 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 root out cor to to get corruption at its root. And I think uh, Wolfgang was talking about about this theoretically. Yes, we can understand. But as Mark said, the point is to to, to change it. Yeah. And I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, he hopes that uh, uh, actors, individual actors. Independent actors such as ourselves can discuss more later, and uh, we can somehow uh, uh, live, get to live to see a, a better world uh, uh, soon. Yeah. I think that's it for me. Now, the rest of the time, uh, you can take as long as you want, uh, buddy, uh, to finish your points, and then after that, we'll end uh, with a short closing statements from each of us. Thank you, buddy. On to you. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, uh, let me just start with, uh, so I've got some, some comments here, um, some questions. Um, from Tabo, he asks about um, people in government that have shares in private companies and the conflict of in interest that, that can happen uh, you, where they, they carry out policies that, that benefit those companies and they've got shares in the companies. Um, and this is it's quite a problem. Um, I think we we see it around the world, um, not just in terms of shares, but we see people in government move from governments, like they call it the revolving door, where you move straight from government to a big position in a big bank or something like that. And I think I just saw that happen. And um, I thought it was just in South Africa because um, in... Uh, in South Africa, our, our Ministry of our Minister of Finance tends to to leave straight away, become a, a consultant for a big bank, and then the minister, the, the 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 governor of the Reserve Bank will go straight into another bank, and then they'll come from a bank before, or you know, and and then I saw recently, I think it was yesterday, there was a, I saw a, an article that um, one of the British, I think it was the Minister of Finance or something, I can't remember, but and he'd move straight into Goldman Sachs or something like that. Um, so it is definitely a big, it's, it's a big problem. 
And sometimes the, the, the institutions themselves actually benefit these, um, these big companies. So you've got like, in South Africa, we have um, the South African Reserve Bank, which uh, the policies, uh, if, on the surface of it, it looks like they benefit certain financial companies um, at the expense of the productive sector. So, and then you have to wonder what influence the financial companies have over these institutions. Um, so that, that's something that, that needs to definitely, I'm not sure what the solutions are, um, maybe democratizing um, these institutions somehow. Um, uh, next question. Oh, the foreign investment capital. Yeah, so this is something that I'm quite uh, interested in. South Africa's very interesting case because we've actually got, um, we, we actually run a trade, a trade surplus. Um, and so our trade and services account has been surplus for the last like five years. And it's been pretty, actually before that pretty much balanced, it goes in and out of, of trade surplus, a little bit of deficit, a little bit of surplus. Um, but for the last five years, we've, we've had a trade surplus, but our current account is in deficit. So we've been running a current account deficit, which means that there's more um, money, we're paying more money out of the country than what we're receiving for um, goods, services, and investments. So what's actually driving our current account deficit is the payment of interest, dividends, and profit to foreign investors for their money that they're investing in or towards us. And the money that they're investing is money that they're getting at, at nearly 0% interest because their central banks are, are basically what they call printing money uh, by the trillion. And they're getting money for nothing and they put it in, in South Africa. And we are paying for that money, we are paying like 10%, the state pays uh, just about 10% to borrow that money on government bonds um, and also the different various bonds. So they, foreign investors are extracting so much profit from lending us money that they're getting at 0% that it's actually driving our current account into deficit um, of about 200 billion a year and uh, the rands. And even though we've got a, so we've got a trade surplus, but we're still in 200 billion rand deficit because of all this money that's being extracted to pay for the money that we're borrowing. And um, it's, it's an interesting dilemma because, um, you know, the obvious solution to, to me seems to be that we need to, rather than borrow money from overseas at 10%, we should be creating money from our own central bank um, and, and driving local investments so that more of the profits and the, and the dividends and interest stays inside South Africa and gets South Africa working, gets, um, reduces our unemployment, goes into helping our own people uh, live better lives instead of you know, sending all this money overseas. Um, so I think that that's a really, uh, you know, and, and, and it, the, 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 just in terms of this topic, it's quite interesting because the, the excuse that we are given that while we can't, Prince our own money is because of corruption. So the, the excuse is you can't trust the, the South African government with uh, control over the central bank or borrowing from the central bank because as soon as you have cheap money, people are just going to go crazy. They're going to just spend it, uh, take the money for themselves, all this kind of stuff. So corruption is being used as an excuse to, um, to keep this whole austerity thing going so that we end up paying more interest for money because there's not a, there's no supply of money in South Africa at the moment. We have to borrow it. Um, and that's, um, so that's one thing that I think is really interesting as ties into this conversation is that I actually got it on my slide here. I'll just put it on there quickly. Um, so I, I have it. So the same powerful neoliberal lobby groups that promoted privatization and outsourcing are now using the corruption that has resulted to call for more outsourcing and privatization. And they point to corruption and they say, see, the government is corrupt and inefficient. 
we should reduce the size of government further and privatize and outsource more. So they're going to end up, you know, selling states, uh, selling, selling the public assets and money for, you know, for cheap, keep doing more of that. And that's the solution somehow. Um, and then it's used to justify austerity policies, which obviously drives up the cost of money um, and drives up unemployment, drives down uh, production, local production. Um, corruption is used as a, to allow the South African Reserve Bank to let, uh, to not allow the South African Reserve Bank to lend directly to government. We just discussed that. And then it's used to call for a smaller state and more outsourcing and more privatization. So that's kind of, um, kind of wraps up where I think everything that I'd like to say. I did, ha I did have a whole uh, long thing about the, all the benefits that come from moderating pay gaps. Um, but I think that this, in terms of money, um, monetary supply, I think that the, the South African Reserve Bank um, has, a, has a role to play too in terms of corruption because um, corruption, if you think about it, corruption, um, it's inflationary because whatever money that's, that the government, uh, whatever, whatever inefficient spending there is from the government is uh, increasing the money supply in the private sector for less return. So what that does is you're actually creating, you, you're creating an inflation, unnecessary inflation in the system. So, um, and also money is getting sent overseas to tax havens, that kind of stuff, extracted out of the economy. Um, so that drives the rand weaker and also that's all falls, it all falls, um, under the South African Reserve Bank constitutional mandate, which is to, to um, control inflation in a way that uh, fosters a balanced and sustainable growth. So um, there's a role that the South African Reserve Bank is mandated to actually play in, in reducing corruption. Um, and one of the ways that I thought of that they could do that would be to have some sort of a, a, a blockchain uh, currency that's and banking system where they could track public money as it gets spent into the system. So you could actually see where that money is going. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's our money that's being spent as citizens. So we should actually be able to, it could even be like an open ledger so everybody can see what's going on. Um, the, the money gets paid into a, into a company and where does that company pay? And everyone that wants to do any research into that can go on the open block, the open ledger and, and see where it's going. And that's, I think that would also help a lot. I mean, obviously, uh, there probably might be some loopholes, but there's a lot less in a system like that than um, without those kind of measures put in place. I think that kind of uh, brings me to the, the end of my, my part in this thing. Um, thanks very much, Suya. Um, and everybody else, Wolfgang and, Sh and Shoibu, I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, handing it over to you. Thank you. Uh, have you answered all the other uh, uh, participants, the audience question? I believe, uh, for example. Uh, let me just. Yeah. So we can, we can, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, I think I did. Uh, the question of Francis uh, Fuk Fukuyama. I'm, I think maybe um, Wolfgang, if you could answer that question, because I'm not really an expert on Francis uh, Fukuyama, and uh, you seem to be. So I think you'd do a better job at that. So um, I, I think some, just si see. Simon, have, you have answered Simon's question also, yeah? Okay. All right, you have answered it, yeah? All right. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, uh, so, uh, 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 can I, before going to Wolfgang, so can I confirm, uh, buddy? So I think it's you or some other uh, South African who says that the South African government is borrowing dollars from the United States Federal Reserve, but the dollars doesn't actually leave the Federal Reserve. So the South African Central Bank just prints the equivalent amount of runs to that dollar and use that run to fund uh, their programs. Is that true? Is that correct? It's, it's a very strange situation that um, 
So what happens uh, with with the banking system is that you've got the euro dollars and normal dollars. Don't, no, the normal dollars don't leave America in terms of banking. It's it's you got euro dollars that that are credit that's based on uh, credit that's in the American bank. So um, no, the 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 money doesn't actually get into South Africa. The dollars it's just credits that's in dollar. It's like dollar credit that's that's in the South African Reserve Bank. Um, foreign exchange account. And um, so what's happening is that the treasury of South Africa is borrowing in dollars from the IMF and is spending, is gonna take those dollars, um, that, so that, that money will go into the treasury's account at the South African Reserve Bank, uh, the foreign, foreign ex exchange account. And then um, as it spends, as the South African Reserve Bank spends, that money into the South African economy, which obviously using rands, uh, the South African Reserve Bank will exchange rands with um, the dollars in the treasury's account. The dollars will move over to the South African Reserve Bank uh, foreign exchange account. So basically, um, instead of just borrowing money from the South African Reserve Bank at whatever rate the South African Reserve Bank could lend it to them, which is the cheapest rate is at the repo rate, um, because they have to sterilize, res it's a kind of a complicated thing, but they have to sterilize reserves as they're going to, in order to keep the interest rates at a certain level. Uh, the cheapest rate that you can do that is at the repo rate. Um, instead of doing that, they're borrowing dollars from America and, um, and then they're gonna give, the, the South African Reserve Bank's gonna basically print money, the rands anyway, just it's a computer entry, but they put it onto the, into the the treasury side of the treasury account, the rands, and but they don't need to have dollars to do that. They could just lend rands. So but my for some reason they are doing that, saying that they need to do that. Yeah, my understanding is when countries borrow borrows dollars, they use it to pay for dollar purchases or anything uh, that is dollar related or anything that is foreign country related. For example, to repay their debt to pay their debt, sorry, not repay, to pay their debt or to pay for imports. So are you saying that this is not the case currently for South Africa? South Africa's uh, foreign exchange reserves are currently the highest that they've ever been. So um, we've been building up our foreign exchange reserves over, over the last 30 years, basically. And, and um, our current account deficits, as I said, that's been due to paying for money that we're borrowing um, in every in, in, a, in any given year is normally about um, 200,000 Rand. Um, and um, our foreign exchange, so you, you normally you have a, a foreign exchange reserve to cover the current, you need to have a certain amount of months in advance of, you know, in case um, you have a little bit of a shock and you need more dollars, you need more foreign, you need to more uh, forex to, to import, maybe have an export shock or something. Um, so, but we've actually got like years of, we've got, we've got years of currency of, of, uh, of a current account deficit, of the normal current account deficit. We could, we could run that current, current account deficit for basically like two years and, and even more. How much is, uh, We've got we've got fifty eight billion dollars um, worth of foreign. It's not. I mean, so fifty eight billion dollars in in rand. You've got to times it by eighteen, um, and our current account deficit's normally two two hundred two hundred billion. So that's in rands. So we've got we've got. I think it's actually about nine years worth of. And we've got enough foreign exchange for nine years worth of of um, of this of running the current account deficit that we have the problem is that um, uh, because we're borrowing money from overseas and this 40 percent 30 percent now of our government debt is foreign it's not foreign denominated but it's it's um, owned by foreigners it's rand debt but it's owned by foreigners um, that uh, there is you know if if there was a, a exodus of of foreign investors, like if they just pulled their money out, you'd have a, an exchange uh, rate 
I think you got you said that you you guys experienced something like that. So we are a little bit at the mercy of um, capital flows, but um, those can also be um, you know you could have capital. Uh, what do you call them when you stop capital from from moving in and out of the country too too fast? You could put exchange controls on and stuff like that, but. Um, yeah, we, we we're not doing we're not in such a bad position. So uh, I don't know why we we need to borrow those dollars. All right, thank you very much, buddy. So I guess this is all back to I mean this is all this is, this gets us to the issues that uh, Wolfgang are discussing. Yeah, we cannot limit ourselves to uh, let me see here to the uh, uh, level of uh, the state. Yeah, we must see the interstate system also or the uh, uh the global system also where uh apparently or not apparently where the finding is uh, lots of pain were experienced to build the institution uh of the let's say european states or the post-colonializing states uh to, to come to where it is now so i guess i'll give the uh, a few minutes for you Wolfgang, to give your closing statement and then we will close this uh, webinar. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, well, uh, thanks very much uh, for putting together the, the webinar. It was very interesting to hear all your points of view. And um, thanks for the opportunity to present my point of view also. Um, maybe um, um, I. I close with answering one question from the chat. Um, what, what can actually be done uh, be done about corruption? Because I haven't said anything about that. Um, I just mentioned it's a difficult problem and you rightly said, well, with Marx, uh, now what, what can we actually do? That's the main question here. And um, well, Fukuyama gives a few examples historically what has actually uh, worked to combat corruption within a state. and. Um, essentially, he has these three um, variants, um, either a, a, an existential threat to a state from the outside, which forces that state to organize in its re, uh, resources um, in the best possible way to defend itself. That would be the example of Prussia. Um, and that also then leads to the introduction of things like uh, civil service exams, where you can't just recruit uh, people you know into the government services, but people have to undergo very strict exams to show their qualification. But you can also, of course, do these civil service um, exams to introduce them without having an external threat. And he gives the example of England, um, who did that in a series of reforms because they used to have a very, very corrupt government sector as well. And then the third example he gives, that was also um, successful, um, is the United States during the New Deal era and before that and the progressive movement. And I guess that's probably the um, best model um, for people like us who are trying to learn about um, how to uh, how to approach this kind of thing um, is to look at that more closely. Um, Fukuyama starts that in his book and he gives a whole chapter on that that may be interesting for you to, to take a look at um, because the United States also had a very, very corrupt uh, government sector uh, right into, into the 20th century, uh, right up until uh, World War I and even after that. Um, and um, as, as I said, the progressive movement to Fukuyama was a very important um, move to overcome that in a way without there being a huge external threat. And I think that's probably the experience that we can learn the most from. Um, on an international level, um, to make a last point here, that I think is essentially the same problem, but it's much, much more difficult because it's so difficult to coordinate activities um, internationally without having um, reliable international institutions, uh, state level institutions that actually can enforce global rules. Um, and therefore you have a sort of a constant uh, nation states beggaring uh, thy neighbors uh, problem or a collective action pr uh, problem internationally that's very hard to, uh, to um, eliminate. Um, but I think 
the best we can do is do with the institutions that we have and try to improve them as best as we can. I mean, the, the European Union has had many critics um, during the past few years, but I think um, it still is a better choice than abandoning the European Union and going back to the nation states um, or abandoning the euro. I mean, the euro has saved Europe um, massive currency speculation, for example, and much massive exchange rate uh, fluctuations. Um, and so even though these are institutions that are flawed and that are not as good and not as efficient as nation states, um, I think we should um, hold on to them and reform them uh, rather than just do away with them. Okay, and I think I'll close with that. And um, thanks again very much for the opportunity and for all your contributions. Thank you very much. Uh, I forgot to share these things. Yeah, uh, so I would like to take the last minute to share what I have uh, 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 opened here. For example, uh, this is, can be the topic for our next uh, 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 webinar. Yeah? Can continue with this. Uh, uh, one so <laughs> uh, we have here flipping the corruption myth. Uh, corruption is by far not the main factor behind persisting poverty in the global south by Jason Hickel. Actually, this is a series of articles by Jason Hickel. Yeah. So and then how Britain stole for this is what Buhari said and it in reverse how poor countries develop rich countries. Again, this is at an international level. This is the same article for LSE and uh, Western media's narrow colonial definition of corruption. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, I guess, uh, oh, okay. Uh, the last words are going to be given by Pak Sohibol. Uh, after him, we will close. Thank you. Terima kasih Pak Wolgam dan Bari dan semua yang ikut termasuk Pak Sahian Asmara calon wali kota kita untuk Medan. Uh, dunia berubah, ilmu pengetahuan teknologi uh, maju terus berkembang. Tapi satu hal yang saya catat, korupsi juga makin sophisticated dan kita akhirnya mengenal lawful corruption. Saya kira ini malah petaka kemanusiaan dan peradaban. So in essence, he said that uh, what we need to worry most now is lawful corruption. Corruption that are legal uh, uh, in the international, national, and regional state. So corruption that is uh, permitted by laws uh, in the, at the national and the regional state. As Wolfgang State internationally, we have a lack of laws, we have a lack of uh, international institutions. So uh, basically, internationally, everything that happens can be termed under lawful corruption. So thank you to everyone who has attended. Uh, thank you for the speakers, thank Wolfgang, you. Buddy, Sohibul. Thank you, Pak Sahian, Asmara, Afrilia, Simon Satoshi, Tabo Kauluza, forgive me for saying the name wrong, Mukelani Zulu, Franz Masin, Aulia Siregar, Patul Jana, and Taguan Rambe. See you in the next webinar. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, ahoy. Bye. Bye-bye.